George R. R. Martin skyrocketed to fame through his series of novels, A Song of Ice and Fire, which became the basis for the HBO show Game of Thrones. The books have sold more than 20 million copies worldwide. They are inspired by real historical events such as the War of the Roses, but they also feature fantasy elements, including dragons and sorcery. We offer up an encore presentation of our interview with Martin conducted earlier this year by correspondent Gwyneth Dolan at the Jean Cocteau Cinema in Santa Fe, which he owns. They, they discuss his process, the pressure from his fans to finish the books, and how he keeps track of all those characters he has created. George R.R. R. Martin, thank you very much for being with us today. Hey, you're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Welcome to the Jean Cocteau. Thank you. So uh, you originally thought there would be three books in the series that begins with A Game of Thrones and that each book would take a year or so to write. Yes, yes, was, I, was, I was young and foolish in those days. That was 20 years ago. <laughs> oh, God, I'm more than 20 years ago, actually. I think uh, 1991 I started writing this. I actually didn't know how many books or whether there would be any books when I started writing it. I, I, maybe this is a short story. Maybe it's a novella. Um, at a certain point, I decided it was a novel, and then pretty clearly jumped to trilogy because I knew it was an epic fantasy. And in those days, in the early mid-90s, um, the general form of epic fantasies was still trilogies. That had been kind of set in stone ever since J.R.R. Tolkien and, and Lord of the Rings had come out back in the 50s. And oddly enough, Tolkien's novel was not a trilogy when he wrote it. He wrote one long book. It was his publisher who decided that it had to be divided into three volumes. Mm. The Tolkien trilogy was a big success, and then everybody started doing trilogies. That's what I thought mine would be initially, but uh, obviously, as it did with Tolkien, the tale grew in the telling, and it uh, it burst out of the trilogy bounds pretty pretty quickly. Well, now you have millions of loyal fans who are clamoring for the next installment, and by clamoring, I mean, sometimes not so politely. I mean, there's like, they're haranguing, begging, demanding. Do you feel an obligation to them? Uh, obligation is an odd word. Uh, I don't know I would go with that word. I certainly feel a desire to finish the book. Um, and it must be said that, oh, I do get a lot of emails and, and mail mails of the type you're describing. There are also many, many that are supportive, and probably far more of people saying, take your time, I love the books, whenever you're ready, I'll be here. Um, of course, which is an attitude that I, I find far, far, far more pleasant than the endless, when, it, when will it be done, when will it be done. I've actually given up answering the question when it will be done. I, I, in the early days, you know, especially after the third book, because the fourth book took a really long time, um, and I kept being wrong. People said when it would be done, and I would give an answer, and then it would not be done by then. I would run into some problem, or I would decide to rewrite, or I would change course. And once you miss, once you give a date, and then you miss that date, that's that's like there's an element of the audience that thinks you're doing it deliberately, and right. you know there are even some strange conspiracy theorists out there who are convinced that I, I finished the whole thing years ago, but I'm just hiding the books in my cellar and releasing them in order to maximize something or other. There's a lot of craziness that goes on, but uh, it's pressure, and you know the the obligation is to the work itself. You, I, I'm telling a story. It's however many books you divide it into three books, four books seven books, which is what I'm presently going for. It's one story, much as Tolkien's Lord of the Rings is one story. It has a beginning, it has a lot of middle, and eventually it will have an end. But does that pressure from all of those people, and, and from HBO, from your publisher, does that get under your skin? Does it rattle you? Does it make it harder for you to sit down and write? Yeah, to some extent it does. But when the writing is going well, it doesn't matter, you know, when I'm, when I'm there and working and I, I, I just kind of fall through my computer screen and I forget the world, I forget deadlines, I forget the TV show and the emails and all of that stuff and it's just me and the characters and the world that I'm describing and it, I'm writing a page at a time and a scene at a time and a word at a time. You create so many characters. We have a hard time keeping track of them sometimes. <laughs> How do you do it? I mean, do you have a, a wall where you've tacked pictures or note cards, or 
is your mind just I do have I do have note cards and uh, well not note cards but I, I have computer files I have genealogies and charts and things like that and I have some pieces of paper on which I've scrolled a few things but less than you would think most of it is is my mind I, I often say that it's uh, it's uh, probably some strange sort of mental illness or something that I've <laughs> I'm using the the synapses in my brain that most people use for remembering real people to remember all these characters it's like I meet real people and I forget their names two minutes after I meet them it's in one ear and out the other uh, you know I wish everybody went through life with name tags all the time I would probably be much better my mind is a sieve as far as remembering real people but I can remember these uh, these characters that I introduced for one scene ten years ago in book two or something like that and you know who they are and what they look like and that's stuck in my brain so that it that surely is a sign that I'm deranged but uh, hopefully it's a good sort of derangement that allows me to write these books your characters are perhaps more colorful than our own lives but <laughs> I'm thinking of the hound and Jamie Lannister and Daenerys they're constantly doing things that are amazing and uh, shocking and evil and we we're terrified and then uh, they'll do something like a grandmother will murder a child and we jump off the couch like this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there, it he was a particularly nasty child. <laughs> he was terrible and he deserved it. Yeah. But it presents a lot of interesting ethical situations. I think somewhere there's a college professor teaching a class called Game of Thrones, you know, the ethics. Actually, uh, I believe there are several classes being taught in Game of Thrones Is around the country. Is ethics something that intrigues you? Yes, I, 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 you know, ethics, morality, the, you know, the whole question of right and wrong, of, of uh, heroism and villainy, uh, these are all, these are all issues. I mean, I, I've always taken as my writing mantra uh, what William Faulkner said in his uh, Nobel Prize acceptance speech where he said, the only thing worth writing about is the human heart in conflict with itself. And I believe that. And that's, that's what you see in Game of Thrones and hopefully in many of my other earlier works as well. And that exists in all good, good literature, I believe. Uh, genre doesn't matter. I mean, I've worked primarily in, in uh, genres of science fiction and fantasy, to some extent in horror. And I read a lot in those genres, but I also read in many other genres, from literary fiction and classics of literature, mystery novels, uh, thrillers, historical fiction. I love historical fiction. And genre doesn't matter. They, whether it has spaceships in it or vampires or dragons, uh, it, still, it, it can't be about the spaceships. You know, it has to be about the people on the spaceship, the human heart in conflict with itself. It can't be about the castle or the dragon. It has to be about the dragon's mother, in the case of Daenerys, and what she chooses to do with the immense power conferred on her by these engines of destruction that have uh, been put into her hands. That's, that's where my interest lies, the, the human heart in conflict with itself. There has been criticism of the sexual violence in the books, and perhaps more so in the show, and they're different. And that is historically accurate. I mean, war uh, treated women, always has treated women very, very badly. Um, yes, um, rape has taken place in virtually every war that ever happened, and, and not just in ancient times, although in medieval times it was, it was so endemic, it was almost accepted as, you know, that, that was part of what happened in war. And if your, your town was taken, then the other army would rape all your women. Um, and um, it, it continues to this day. I mean, the, the, the rape camp, camps in Bosnia a few years ago, the, uh, the stuff that happened in World War II, I mean, it's, it's there, it's always there. You can't leave it out. So it, 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 it is historically accurate, but you've also taken advantage of the possibilities of fantasy by creating female characters who couldn't have existed and who uh, warriors, manipulative priestesses, uh, the queen with dragons, well, the dragons certainly did not exist. Although, it should be pointed out, I'll get back to the main question in a minute, but it should be pointed out that in the real medieval times, people believed in dragons. 
people believed in witches, you know? So like we include a witch, like Melisandre in my book called the Red Witch and she's a fantasy element because we didn't have that in the real world. But the people who living in that real world thought they had it. They executed women because they thought they were witches. They hung them or they burned them or they pressed them to death under large stones. And if you could bring one here with a time machine, they would say, of course we had witches. What are you talking about? Witches were real. They killed my cow with a spell. They gave me warts. They, they you know, had suckled the devil uh, every night under the dark of the moon. And they believed there were dragons out there. They believed there were manticores. And if you believe something enough, it becomes part of your world and it affects the way you live your life and it affects the decisions you make. And, um, you know, getting back to the issue, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've added dragons, I've added some fantasy elements, some magic and all that. But I don't think the women are magical, yeah. But it, to be historically accurate would be to limit your character development. It's more fun to uh, move into fantasy with women. I don't, I don't think I have moved into fantasy with women, aside from Danny's dragons. Um, I think you can find, you can find an analog for every one of the, the women in my, in my books. Yeah, it's, they're unusual. They're the exception. They're not the rule. You know, but the exception is what you want to write about. You don't necessarily want to write about uh, the typical example, the typical knight or the typical king or peasant. It's, it's the ones who are a little more complicated than that that give you a little more juice to write about. You know, what, what didn't happen, um, where I think some of my fellow uh, fantasists move into fantasy is, is <clears throat> with their depictions of the, the class system. Uh, there's a, my books were at least partly written as an answer to what I call the Disneyland fantasies out there, where writers who, uh, Tolkien imitators chiefly, who love the, having the princesses and the knights and uh, the castles and all of that. So they put all of that in, but they don't really seem to realize what it grew out of, the, like the class distinction. So you, you always get the scene where the spunky peasant girl tells off the, uh, you know, the arrogant lord. Um, the spunky peasant girl who told off a real arrogant lord in, in like 12, 23, would have had her head chopped off or at least her tongue ripped out. Uh, you know, they, these social systems had teeth. You, you can't just take 21st century Americans and, and put them in surcoats and, and mantles and give them a sword and pretend that they're medieval people. The medieval way of thinking was quite different. Leadership is an interesting issue in your writing. There's some really bad bosses here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> then and now, right? <laughs> yes. But is that an interesting issue of how to be a great leader, the elements that that takes, or how they fail? It's something I want my readers to think about, yeah, because it's not easy. I mean, Again, there's a certain metafictional thing here where I'm partly what I'm doing is I'm engaging in a debate with the fantasists who have gone before me. Um, bad ones, but also great ones like Tolkien and, and uh, Mervyn Peake and um, T.H. White and some of, the, some of the great, great artists who have written seminal works of fantasy. There's an assumption in Tolkien, and mind you, Tolkien was doing something very different than what I'm doing, so I'm not criticize him for not doing, but he's drawing from long traditions of myth where the king was very closely associated with the land. And if you had a good king, then the land would prosper. And if you had a bad king, the land would wither. And like someone like Aragorn who becomes king at the end of Lord of the Rings, he said, and Aragorn ruled for a hundred years and he ruled wisely and well. It's all very well to say that he ruled wisely and well. Um, because he was a good man. But actually, if, if from where I look at it, I look at the real world and I look at real kings and I look at real presidents and lords and you know, being a good man is not enough. It's not enough, it wasn't enough then and it's not enough now. I mean, you, if that was enough, Jimmy Carter would have been like the best president of the 20th century because he certainly proved, I think, that he's probably 
the best man of all the people who have served as president, the most moral and compassionate and intelligent and all of that. But he wasn't that terrific a president. Um, on the other hand, we've had some presidents, and in the old days they've had some kings, who were probably terrible people, but they were good for their countries because they made the correct decisions, you know. So I look at Aragorn and say, well, what was, what was his tax policy? What was his, you know, after the war, what did he do with all these leftover orcs? Uh, you know, did he hunt them down and kill them all? Or did he follow a policy of orc genocide? Or did he just left live and then, of course, they would breed more and then the orcs would come boiling out of the mountains? I mean, that's a problem. How do you solve that problem? Uh, in this uh, last season of the show, we've watched Daenerys struggle with leadership and how to, you know, how fierce she should be with the people she's vanquished. Should she kill all the slave masters? How many should live? And and she's stumbling. And this is a yeah, this is a huge part of uh, a Dance with Dragons, the fifth book in the series. Uh, Danny's uh, attempts to rule in Marine and the struggles that she's having in Marine uh, are a major theme of that book. How do you how do you do this? It's not easy. It's not like, oh, here's here's the right decision to do, you know. If we all knew the right decision, then we, we wouldn't have the kind of vituperative politics that we have because obviously in our society or in any society, there are people who think this is the right way to go. No, no, this is the right way to go. We have to be harder. We have to be softer. We have to go to war. We have to make peace. You know, you we look at this and we look at history. People look at history, real history, from the benefit of hindsight and and. You have to take hindsight off the table, I think, when you're, when you're analyzing this and try to think about these issues as the time. And I'm trying to give my characters, especially the ruling characters, some difficult problems to solve. And then their own beliefs and their own personality and their own views on, on what the obligation of a king or lord is uh, to their people comes through, you know? So. You mentioned beliefs. It, religion is is a, a thread that that flows through here. What is it about faith that attracts you? Well, religion has played a huge part in human history and was very important in the Middle Ages. So I think it really needs to be reflected in in fantasy, um, and particularly in a world where real magic exists. And we get that. I was talking about it earlier with the dragons and the witches and all that, but. You know, cons consider that, I mean, we, we have a society now where some people are very religious, some people are basically secular and agnostic or atheist, or even if they do follow religion, it's they don't really guide their actions by it. It's sort of paying lip service to it. But imagine what the effect would be on religion today, on the world today, if any of our religions actually could perform miracles. Imagine if there was someone going around raising the dead or walking on water or multiplying the, the fishes and, and the bread. You know, everybody would follow that religion. It would be on television. You would be interviewing them and not me, <laughs> you know, and we wouldn't have any hunger anymore because we had all the bread and fish we want. And, uh, you know, it would change things. Well, the fantasy, many fantasies out there have real magic. And they have real magic, in some of them, a lot of powerful magic. And then you wonder why, why they have multiple religions then, because if people can actually do this kind of stuff, I think everybody would follow them. Now, in my world, the religion is there, but it's, it's more like the real world. Um, people believe, people think that certain things are happening, but the gods don't actually turn up, and the miracles are unreliable and we don't quite know how everything works. We think there may be agencies, supernatural agencies at work, but meanwhile there are various contesting religions with their belief systems and their pantheons that are struggling for supremacy. You spent time as a screenwriter and you've written several episodes for HBO. Do you wish that you could write them all? I wish I could write more of them. You know, uh, we do 10 episodes a season and I write one usually. But if I wasn't writing the books, I would be a, hopefully a bigger part of the show and I could write, uh, you know, two episodes, maybe three episodes a season. That would be fun. But uh, 
you know, that's, uh, I can wish for it, but it's not going to happen. I, I still have two enormous books to write. I have The Winds of Winter, which I'm working on right now. And uh, that's going to be another monster. And then when I finish that, I have uh, the last book, A Dream of Spring, which uh, is going to be another 1,500-page monster where I try to wrap all this up. And uh, these books take me a long, long time to do. So even just writing one episode a season it is going increasingly hard because it's, you know, you have to put the book aside and sort of go back in time to things you wrote two or three or five or seven years ago and, and do new versions of them. It kind of breaks the stride a little. So, yeah, I wish I could be more involved in the show. I wish I could be over there in Belfast on a set. I wish I could be taking part in all the auditions and the casting sessions and seeing the dailies and working on it the way I worked on the TV shows like Beauty and the Beast and The Twilight Zone when I was more active in television. But the truth is I can't, so. You've lived here in Santa Fe since 1979. Right. But have things changed for you recently as the profile of the show and the books has raised and your faces in magazines? Actually, yes, things have changed a lot for me in, in probably in the last four or five years. I mean, I've always been a, a successful writer. I've had an um, excellent career since I sold my first story in 71. I won awards early on. I, I was able to support myself as a full-time writer since 1979. Um, I made pretty good money uh, with these books. I started hitting the bestseller lists with uh, Clash of Kings. The second one was the first book of mine to hit the bestseller list. Since then, each one has done better. So I've always been a successful writer. But what the show has done is made me a celebrity writer. And that's different. That's, I had not anticipated that. And I, yes, I have now reached a point where I am recognized everywhere I go. I can't go to a, go through an airport without stopping for five photographs and signing people's napkins and, and you know, occasionally one of them actually has the books. Um, in restaurants, in going to the movies, anywhere, I'm, I'm, I'm known, I don't know. Uh, not as good things. People come up to me. are very nice. They're they're great. They, you know, but sometimes it gets a little tiring just because there's so many of them. I just keep telling myself it won't be forever. This is my 15 minutes of fame, right? And you know, five years from now there'll be some other show on television, and Game of Thrones will will be thought of hopefully fondly as like uh, NYPD Blue or Hill Street Blues or or you know one of the the great shows in television history, but it won't be on and there'll be some new hot thing that everybody will be uh, all excited about and I can sort of go back to being just a writer and not a celebrity. <laughs> you uh, recently established a screenwriting grant. I did, yes, with the New Mexico Film Foundation, uh, a, a new group founded by uh, Dirk Norris to uh, try to promote um, television and film production here in uh, the land of enchantment. And uh, writing is part of that, of course. I'm a writer, so it's for science fiction and fantasy scripts by New Mexico residents, $5,000 annually. Maybe one of those shows everybody watches next will be written by a New Mexican. That would be, that would be great. You've also recently been raising a lot of money for the Wolf Sanctuary and uh, a food bank. A food depot. Here in Santa Fe, yes, they feed the hungry people of northern New Mexico. And the Wild Spirit Wolf Sanctuary down in uh, Candy Kitchen uh, that rescues wolves and wolf dogs. We're raising a lot of money for it, so hopefully they'll, a few more wolves will be rescued and a few uh, New Mexicans will be a little less hungry. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, my pleasure. Thank you.